Hello, this is Griff in Humboldt Redwood State Parks, and I'm a nature guide for California State Parks. How awesome is that? I'm feeling really grateful. You want to feel grateful? Then check out what belongs to you. All this beautiful prairie and all everything you can see, all those mountainsides, all that stuff, that's part of the 53,000 acres that is... Humboldt Redwood State Park. I have a big announcement this week, but I'm going to save it. But it has to do with every time I tell you guys this is the most beautiful place on earth, and you're like, sure, yeah, of course, you work there. Mm, it's official now. But we're going to get to that later. What we're going to talk about today. Hey, what's up, Robin? What we're going to talk about today is what good are dead trees okay because a lot of us have been conditioned by this like suburban landscape that has all these plants that don't have any bug mites because they're from another country and the um they're from europe or asia and so there's they don't have any insects that depend on them and then we have the sterile green grass that's always cut and smells like chemicals and when we ever anything something dies we have to remove it right away okay and that is that's that way of thinking has got to go away that is not a productive way of thinking especially when you have seven billion people on the planet taking up tons of space we have to make room for wildlife in our personal spaces and so let me show you here what i am talking about because dead trees um fish and wildlife now california fish and wildlife oh my gimbal's tripping uh, calls dead trees wildlife trees and that is because they provide some really important habitat features for wildlife so here's a snag can you guys see that all right okay so a snag is a standing dead tree okay so it's like a bin it my gimbal is tripping oh that's why it's tripping okay um Standing dead trees are really cool because they provide some habitat features, sometimes even more habitat features than they did when they were alive. That's right. Sometimes trees are better for wildlife when they're dead. Okay? And so, why, could, why is that? Well, remember, like, if you want to simplify what habitat means, habitat means home, and, it provide, and there's like four components. Food, water, shelter, and places to raise young. So when a tree dies, it often provides food and shelter and places to raise young for a whole host of animals that it didn't while it was alive. Okay, in fact, National Wildlife Federation biologists say that over a thousand species in North America use dead trees, all right? So dead trees, snags, wildlife trees, once they die, um, they get invaded by funguses and lichens and a lot of uh, wood boring beetles and bark beetle insects. And that is food for a lot of animals like woodpeckers. And so woodpeckers have made these holes here. Now woodpeckers are kind of like little ecosystem engineers because they make these little holes because they're after the grubs of beetles usually. Because it's a big fat protein. It's like a big sack of protein and fat. Like it's like delicious. It's like digging in a, it's like finding a big old sausage for a woodpecker. And so they make these holes and these holes these little nooks and crannies that are created um often become homes for reptiles and amphibians and other insects and other funguses and stuff like that also when the woodpeckers make their dens like flying squirrels might use it types of owls might use it um flying squirrels regular squirrels all kinds of different birds We'll use it. So if you see here, let's look at this. I'm, I'm watching out for the poison oak, y'all. That's why it's taking me a long time to get there. Because I don't want poison oak. So these big holes here, they were probably made by our biggest woodpecker, pileated woodpecker, which is now the biggest um, woodpecker in North America. Used to be second, but the ivory-billed woodpecker went extinct because we destroyed all of its habitat. I, I don't know a whole lot about ivory woodpe woodpeckers, but I know they were in Texas in the south, and they liked that pine forest, and we cleared it all, and they're extinct, which is horrible because they were a beautiful bird, so interesting. Um, and hopefully our pileated woodpeckers don't go extinct. But pileated woodpeckers make big uh, dens inside of trees, which 
they make a new one every year. And so the old ones get occupied by all kinds of different animals. Okay. So snags provide, and look at all the snags here. And there's so many snags here because we do controlled burns on this prairie. Why do we do? You're like, why? Oh no. Well, it's a really good thing. In fact, the indigenous people, they did frequent fires and they kept these grasslands open because grasslands per, bring in more biodiversity, more different kinds of plants that you might want to use for medicines and baskets and elk and deer will come here near your village so you can kill them because back in the day you didn't have a truck that you could put it in um, and haul it lots of it. So you wanted all those things to graze near your house and so you set fires. And frequent, f frequent fires creates low ground fires that aren't devastating. But then Smokey the Bear came along and then this whole like, oh, fires are bad. And so we suppress them for so long that now we have fires. There's a fuel buildup because we haven't been doing those frequent small ground fires. So now we get big fires that destroy habitat and destroy homes, my friend's homes, okay? So we really want to bring back this land management practice of thin cutting and burning. And so snags aren't a problem. People sometimes come to the park and they say, I saw a lot of dead trees and you guys are going to, there's going to be fires. And what's really going to create fires is too much vegetation. Okay. Too much vegetation is going to, is what's going to burn a few snags in an area that has frequent fires is not a fire hazard as much as a place that hasn't been burned and thinned for a hundred years. That's asking for problems okay um so you might see a lot of devastation around me like it looks like it's been dug out and it has see that beautiful plumed plant over there isn't that beautiful it's a horrible invasive that um crews have been out here trying to get rid of that's pampas grass sometimes called jabata grass um actually i think there's two different species i think this is actually the real jabata grass and it's beautiful and people planted it and uh it they're clones of each other. They can reproduce without cross-pollination. So like they're all related, they're all clones of each other and they have very little wildlife value. So we remove them so that they don't take out the uh, native plants. But let me go back to snags. So we talked about why snags are cool. Snags are standing dead trees. Um, hopefully that wind's not interfering with anything. So standing dead trees, they provide cover they provide food, they provide um, food in the form of like the fat beetles and the lichens and the moss that they attract. Sometimes they get really craggy and raccoons move into hollow trees. Um, they also, if you look out over here in this landscape, you see all these dead trees. Sometimes you can find hawks sitting on top of that, scoping out the area. So it provides this like raptor perch so they can hunt below. Very, very, very useful. And then they slowly decompose these dead trees and they're adding nutrients to the soil. And when they fall, like this one did that I'm stepping over here, when they fall, they um, now they're a log and no longer a snag. And reptiles and amphibians crawl underneath there. It holds in water longer, so underneath there stays moist and it's perfect for amphibians. And then the bugs get in there and eat it. And as the bugs fly off, they've been eating this, you know, the in their larval worm form, they were eating all this wood. And when they fly off in their adult form, they're pooping out all this nutrients from this log all over the forest. Okay, everything's connected to everything. Dead trees aren't bad. Logs aren't bad, okay? They're good. They're very good habitat components, okay? Poison oak is good too, but I'm not gonna step in it. So, um, another really cool thing that I found I've been walking around here all day looking for an acorn woodpecker granary, and I did not find one. I was so excited to find acorn woodpeckers out here the other day because I love them. I don't love them just because they inspired Woody Woodpecker. Yes, it's true. Woody Woodpecker is actually an acorn woodpecker. The people who created it went camping, and they heard this on the side of the cabin they were staying in, and they went out and they saw a, a woodpecker that looked like a clown sticking acorns in the side of this house. Hopefully this wind isn't messing up the sound here. And so that's what inspired Woody the Woodpecker. So I'll show you this. The wind is kicking up. So this is a female acorn woodpecker. And you could tell because her forehead is black. See that? Okay. And this is a male acorn woodpecker. And he doesn't have black forehead. So that's how you can tell the difference. And they're one of the most interesting socially interesting animals in the world and i really mean that i'm not just saying that because they're right here um 
and you might hear them in the background. There's a few birds you might hear in the background. The one that's like, waka, 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 that's the acorn woodpecker. The one that's like, Kier! that's a flicker, and it's got a really long tongue. It's got the longest tongue out of the woodpeckers. And you might hear, meh, 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 and that's a white-breasted nuthatch. These are all cool birds that love snags. And then right there, I heard, Chicago, Chicago, and that's California state bird, the California quail that screams Chicago. I wish it should scream Sacramento, shouldn't it? But it screams Chicago. Chicago, Chicago. So what acorn woodpeckers use snags for besides having their like communal nesting dens. Yes, I said that right. A group of sisters will share a den and they'll share husbands and it's called polygynandry. So all the males mate with all the females, all the females mate with all the males. And, um, but there's no incest. They're the first animal besides human that they found has like an incest avoidance culture. So they have this little culture where they don't, they don't have sex with relatives, but they do have multiple sisters uh, raising each other's young and their babies from the previous years raising their youngs. And these birds can live a long time, 17 years, and they don't migrate um, because during the summer they eat insects, like most other birds eat insects, and that's why insects are, I call them the plankton of the land. But when everybody else migrates to Mexico and Central America where there's still insects, the acorn woodpeckers collect acorns and it takes a long time to make this granary. So see this, this is a tree full of acorns. And so they collect acorns and they pound them into this tree and then acorns shrink as they dry. And so as they shrink, they get loose in that hole and a squirrel could steal them, but the acorn woodpeckers aren't having that. They leave two of them, two of their tribe, you know, cause they hang out in this group, this gang. And um, they'll move the acorns around. Here's another picture. They'll move the acorns around until they fit them in a nice fit tight hole so that the squirrels can't rob from them. So there again, there is a male, see, no black forehead. And this is also a male, no black forehead. And acorn woodpeckers eat acorns all winter long. And they eat insects all summer long. And that's why I talked before about sudden oak death, this invasive fungus the Uumycetes water mold fungus, Phytophthora morums, and how it's killing oaks in California, and how that oak tree is a keystone species because so many other animals rely on it, and acorn woodpeckers are one of the species that rely on it. And when there's not enough acorns around, they will starve to death during the winter. So we really want to make sure that we have oak trees around for acorn woodpeckers. And again, snags aren't bad. You can have snags on your property. You just want to like make some safety considerations. You don't want it leaning against your house, okay? And if it's far away from your house and has termites, usually the termites are not gonna get to your house. Termites, females do fly around in the fall, but it's not automatically they're gonna get into your house. Um, and then you don't want it so tall that if it falls, it's gonna kill people. So you can have a four foot tall snag or a five foot or a six foot tall snag um, away from a walkway and it will serve the same purpose. You might get woodpeckers in it. You might, you know, get some uh, cavity nesting bird. Any bird that uses a bird box um, will is a cavity nesting bird. Okay, a bird box is is like a birdhouse is like a pretend snag. Okay, a bat box is also like a pretend snag. A lot of bats use trees. People always think bats in caves, but actually a lot of bats use trees too. So you can help. You can go to National Wildlife Federation. And they have a whole section on in their gardening for wildlife section about snags. So thank you very much for joining me. I'm going to look and see if you guys have any questions. And I will answer questions tonight and tomorrow too. Um, hi from Missouri. Hello. Hey, Sandra. What's up, Lorena? What's up, Riley? From the Redwoods at Swanton Pacific Ranch. Thank you guys for joining me. And please like and share. And we are on here every day at 3 o'clock. And remember that you guys are the stewards of state parks. We need you guys to understand the wildlife that live here and all the connections so that you can see how important it is that we continue protecting these places, continue doing restoration, continue doing invasive species removal like we've been doing here. Um, you can see on the ground. Continue doing these controlled burns so we can maintain this area for biodiversity. So thank you very much, and I will see you guys. I'm going to be on Humboldt Redwood State Parks page at 3.30 doing the same talk. So if you missed part of it and you want to pick it up there, do it, and um, I'll see you at 3.30.